Good morning, Church. Let me read to you in the book of Sam, chapter 5, in New Living Translation. For the choir director, a Sam of David, to be accompanied by the flute. O Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For I pray to no one but you. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. O God, you take no pleasure in wickedness. You cannot tolerate the sins of the wicked. Therefore, the proud may not stand in your presence, for you hate all who do evil. You will destroy those who tell lies. The Lord detests murderers and deceivers. Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. Lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. My enemies cannot speak a truthful word. Their deepest desire is to destroy others. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with flattery. O God, declare them guilty. Let them be caught in their own traps. Drive them away because of their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. For you bless the godly, O Lord. You surround them with your shield of love. Psalm chapter 5.
don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop.
Good morning. Allow me to read Psalm 9, verses 1 to 2. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Before we go in prayer, let me ask you four questions. What are you thankful for in this challenging season? Can you remember the good and the bad things God used to bring His wonderful purposes and deeds into your life? Are you completely glad and happy in God despite of what's happening in your community, our country, and in the world? And lastly, is your whole life driven to sing praises to God's great name? These verses in Psalm 9 do challenge and encourage us to give thanks to God, to recount or remember all His wonderful deeds, to be glad and happy in God despite of our situations, and to sing praises to His name. And in prayer, we can do that. Psalm 9 verses 1 to 2 is teaching us as church family to be thankful to God and to give praise to Him in prayer. Church family, I invite you right now to pause and pray. Father, teach us how to give thanks and sing praises to your name in prayer. We acknowledge your greatness and power over our lives. You are sovereign and mighty Lord. No one compares to you. With our whole heart, we give thanks to you. We thank God for your gift of salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit that transforms our inmost being in this season. We thank you for making us more and more Christ-like, admitting our great need for your grace and truth. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to love, care, and serve our families while we are staying home. What a huge blessing to wake up every day knowing that you love our families, care, and sustain our daily and physical needs. Also, we are grateful for how your living word transforms our homes. Thank you, God, for our church family. Though we are not meeting face to face, we see how you are using this pandemic to draw our hearts to each other. How the gospel is made visible in the lives of our brothers and sisters who are loving each other, who are caring for one another, who are praying for continuous strength and provision, who are admonishing each other to grow in the word and in prayer, and who are together steadfast in Jesus. We also thank you for the strength clarity and wisdom you are giving to our national leaders as they respond to COVID-19. Though our government is not perfect, our eyes are fixed on you. As our sovereign King and loving Father, who is for us and who is in us. Father, teach our hearts to wait and long for the very day when you say, Pandemic no more. Meanwhile, Continue to stir our hearts to be glad in Jesus as our all-satisfying tre treasure, to give Him praise, to worship Him in spirit and in truth. This we pray to the one who is worthy of our praise and our, all our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Good morning, everyone. So glad that you could join us for worship today at IBC Manila. And thank you so much, worship team, for leading us into a very uh, joyful and very great time of, of singing praises to God and, and uh, worshiping Him today. Praise is such an important factor in our lives, especially, uh, well, any time, but especially now in, in these days that we're facing, in these days that we're living, it is so important that we stop, that we pause to praise God for all of his goodness today. So let me ask you the question, how are you doing? We really are concerned about you, and we want to know if there's any way we can come to your aid. So how are you doing? Please let us know if, if we can come to your aid to help you to minister to your needs. Let me just say that Cindy and I miss you very much. We are so, uh, so anxious in a good way, not worrisome, but so excited about being able to come home and be with you, our church family and our church friends in Manila. We're waiting patiently for God to open the door, and uh, as soon as we can, we, we will be back home in Manila. In the meantime, how good it is to be able to spend time together online, to worship together, and to study God's Word together. We hope that you're praying for us, too. Um, it, we're homesick. We're, we're isolated from you, and, and because of the pandemic, we're isolated from many people. And let me just give you an update. Um, on Friday, the 17th, I had my 33rd radiation treatment. So 33 down, five to go. So this coming week, uh, five more treatments, and that will be the final week of my radiation treatments. And so far, uh, well, God is always good, isn't he? And so far, the radiation treatments have been a lot less uh, of a trouble than I imagined. And God has given me good doctors and good technicians here in Birmingham. And they're doing a wonderful job. Thank you so much for your continued prayers. Well, we continue this marvelous study in the book of Ruth. These first three uh, studies in, that, in the first chapter of this beautiful story has been so moving to me. And I, I pray that the studies have been very moving and inspirational for you as well. Last week, we gave attention to bitter, bitter Naomi. As far as she was concerned, nothing was going her way. As far as she was concerned, her total life was just a bitter mess. In spite of the fact that she was back home, in spite of the fact that this young Moabite woman, Ruth, left family and land behind and followed her all the way back to Bethlehem in that very arduous, difficult journey. In spite of that, Naomi still thinks that the Lord's hand is against her, still thinks that uh, her life is extremely bitter. Well, today, the page turns. Last week, we talked about the question, where is God in all of this? And you, as we discussed last week, may have been asking your God or yourself or other people the same question. Where is God in this COVID pandemic? Where is God in all of these situations, in the quarantine, and everything that's happening around me? Where is God in all this? I'd really like to know. That's really what Naomi was saying in her bitterness. Where is God in all this? Well, today as we turn the page to the second chapter of the story, we begin to see that God is thick in the middle of all of this. Before we tell our story today, just a couple of things to remember. First of all, as I have been talking, let's not forget the bitterness that has set in, in Naomi's heart and what that does to the heart. We talked about that last week, how bitterness just transforms the total mindset and perspective of a person in a very negative and unhealthy way. So let's not forget that. Let's also not forget, however, that the last sentence in last week's story told us that Naomi and Ruth arrived in Bethlehem at the time of the barley harvest. 
And that gave us some hope. Let's not forget that. And there are a couple, a couple of, of concepts, a couple of themes that I want to begin to sort of place in your mind to be thinking about as we hear the story today. The first concept I want to talk to you about is providence. God's providence. Let me just read a, a couple of sentences that describe what we mean by God's providence. God's providence is the intersection of God's sovereignty and God's goodness. The intersection of God's sovereignty and His goodness. We might want to add that it also is the intersection of God's sovereignty and goodness in the affairs of our lives. Providence is God's work in seemingly coincidental events in our lives. God's providence. Keep that in mind as we hear the story today, because that's one of the major themes of the story. Even in uncomfortable and unfavorable circumstances, we need to remember that God is always at work, though sometimes in very subtle ways behind the scenes he is at work so that his people can find favor and that's the second word i want us to think about today favor throughout the scriptures we see this ongoing theme of people needing to wanting to desiring to find favor with god and we'll see that show up in our story today the concept of Finding favor. Back in Genesis, we remember, the world had gone mad, and God looked at the world, and there was not one person on earth who he could find as someone who was faithful and honest and pure, except one man. And the scriptures tell us that, that God, that Noah found favor in the eyes of God. So we're going to talk about, we're going to learn about. God's favor, God's providential favor is a major theme in this story. So are you ready to turn the page and go to chapter 2? Before we do, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And we are excited. We're, we're on the edge of our seats today, ready to hear a turn on the, in the page, a change in the circumstances and situation. We want to see how God is at work in Naomi's life, in Ruth's life. Because, God, we also want to know that you are at work in our lives. Where are you in all of this, God? So open our eyes and our ears and our hearts today so that we can see where you are in all of this. We look forward to that. And we pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, let's turn the page to Ruth chapter 2, and let's hear the story. The story begins in an interesting way. Samuel, who probably was the writer of the story, begins this chapter by introducing us to a new character. He says to us that Naomi had a relative, a close friend, actually a relative of her husband, Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And, it, and he tells us that Boaz was prominent and had noble character. Okay, that's great. Naomi has a relative in Bethlehem named Boaz, who is a very prominent person, has, has noble character. Okay, so what? What does that mean? How does that move the story? Hang on. We'll find out. Then in the second verse of the chapter, Samuel goes on to tell us that Ruth, out of respect for Naomi, asks permission to go into the fields and gather grain. Now this is quite impressive. Already, Ruth understands some of the law of Moses. For we find in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, that Moses, under the direction of the Lord, commanded the Hebrews that whenever they harvested the wheat, they were not to harvest it to the edge of the field, but to leave the edges 
for the poor and the widows and the foreigners to gather wheat. And furthermore, if any stalks were dropped in the harvesting process, the harvesters were to leave them on the ground for those same poor widows and foreigners to glean. It's quite impressive. Ruth already knows some of the Hebrew story and some of the Hebrew scriptures. We don't know how she knows. Perhaps she and Naomi have had some conversations. And perhaps, maybe even along the way, maybe Ruth was asking Naomi, how will we eat? And maybe Naomi said, well, in our law, the harvesters are commanded to leave wheat on the ground for those in need. But it's impressive that this woman who just recently said to Naomi, your God will be my God, is already following the law of God. But out of respect, she asked permission to go into the field to find a place where she could glean grain. But she was looking for more than a field. She was looking for more than grain. It says that she was looking for someone whom she could find favor. There's that concept. Find favor. Ruth is looking for God at work. Well, so as the story goes, Naomi gives her permission and she, she leaves wherever they're living and, and she goes into a f the fields to gather grain behind the harvesters and she just happened to, to be in the portion owned by, you guessed it, Boaz. And now we're beginning to see why the story begins by introducing us to this figure, this character named Boaz. She just happened to be there. Now, we know that she didn't just happen to be there, right? We're looking, she's looking for God at work in all of this. And in the Hebrew language in which this story was originally written, it says that, that Ruth chanced upon chance, which is a Hebrew idiom that is sort of like a, a wink from God to say, there's no way this is just by chance. God is at work. She didn't just happen. God is moving the story. God is moving the events. And God is moving Ruth to a specific field to gather grain. How good is that? Well, later, or it just so happened at that time, Boaz arrives on the scene, and we immediately see why Samuel calls him a man of noble character. As he enters the field, he does something quite remarkable, or I should say he actually says something quite remarkable. He prays a prayer to his workers. The Lord bless you. That's not usual. That's not common. That gives us a picture of a, a godly man. And to get a better, even a better picture of how respected and honored Boaz was by his servants, they pray it back to, to him. The Lord bless you you. And then something remarkable again happens. This story is full of remarkable things. Of all the workers in the field, his paid workers, all the poor and the widows and the foreigners who were gleaning, we can't imagine how many there were. There should have been several, but of all the people there in the fields, Boaz notices one woman. How about that? And he asked the harvesters, who is this young woman that is gleaning in the fields? And the workers already know her story. They say, oh, this is the Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from Moab. She asked us, can I please gather grain in the field among the harvesters? And we said, sure, go ahead. And she came and she has been working hard since dawn. She's been on her feet since the sun rose and she is still working and she only took a short break for a rest. Everyone is already impressed with Ruth. Then Boaz did something again remarkable. He approached Ruth 
unimaginable in that culture. What is he doing? He approaches Ruth and he says, listen, my daughter. Listen to that again, people. Listen, my daughter. Do you hear the words of compassion he has on Ruth? He says, word has come to me. Everything you have done for your mother-in-law, how you left family and home and everything that you knew after your husband's death, and you have come with her to this land that you did not know. And he says, may the Lord reward you for all that you have done. And may you receive a full reward from the Lord of Israel under whose wings you take refuge. Boaz recognizes that Ruth is seeking refuge under God's wings. That's impressive. My Lord, she says to him, how is it that I have found favor with you? You, you have comforted me. You've encouraged me in this. I'm your servant. I'm not like one of your female servants. I'm just a foreigner. And later in the day, or perhaps another day, Boaz invites her to a meal. Now let me say, he has already instructed Ruth to go gather grain day after day. He's already explained to her that he has commanded the men in the harvest field not to touch her. He says, you follow the other women to make sure you stay in my fields. And when you get thirsty, drink from the water I've provided for the workers. But now, he invites her to lunch. And she sits beside him. And he shares roasted grain with her. And she ate until she was full. And she had leftovers that she set aside, kept aside. And when she got up, Boaz went to his young men, his workers, and he said, let her even gather grain among the bundles. In other words, Boaz is going, going beyond expectations. This is not some obligatory obedience to the law of Moses. He's going the extra mile. He's saying, allow her to glean from the bundles. In fact, pull some of the bundles aside and set it aside for her. This is not some duty Boaz is going through. Do you smell it? I smell a romance brewing between Boaz and Ruth. So he tells them to pull stalks from the bundles and leave those stalks for her to glean. He says, don't rebuke her. Let her glean as much as she wants. So Ruth, day after day, gathers grain from the field. And that evening, in particular, she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was 26 quarts of barley. And she picked up the grain, and she goes back into town where Naomi is staying. And Naomi saw what she had gleaned, and Ruth brought out everything, and even the leftovers that she had from that good lunch with Boaz, and she gives it to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Her mother-in-law is flabbergasted. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, is finally seeing where God is in all of this. She says, where in the world did you work today? May the Lord bless that man who noticed you and gave you opportunity. And Ruth told her mother-in-law the exciting news. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that meant to Naomi? Boaz, a relative of her husband Elizabeth, just so happens to be the owner of the field that Ruth found, the man who gave her much favor. Then Naomi said to Ruth, may the Lord bless him because he has not abandoned 
his kindness to the living or the dead. We don't know whether or not Naomi means Boaz or God when she says not abandon his kindness. Maybe both. But she is beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel, as we say. She continued, this man is a close relative. He is one of our redeemers. A subtle way of Samuel giving us a foreshadowing of what is to come. Look at this. Do you see how God is right thick in the middle of all of their mess and all of their circumstances? By his providence, he has moved Ruth to the exact field that Boaz owns. By his providence, he has caught the attention of Boaz on this young Moabite woman. By God's providence, Ruth and Naomi have hope. Maybe a redeemer. So Ruth said, He has told me, stay with the young men until they have finished all of my harvest. And Naomi agrees, It is good for you to work with his servants so that nothing will happen to you in the field. And Ruth stayed close to Boaz's female servants and gathered grain, not only for the barley harvest, but it continued even into the wheat harvest until it was all finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Wow. Do you see what God is teaching us here? We have hope. No matter how unfavorable our circumstances, we have a God. So let me briefly point out six spectacular lessons. What does this mean? What does this story mean for us? Let me share with you six ways. This story has great meaning for us. Hebrews 11:6 6 says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same Lord who is moving the story with Ruth and Naomi, is the same story right thick in the middle of all of this. Same God, same Lord, Redeemer. And so here are six ways, six powerful ways that this meaning has application for us. First, God's providential favor God's providential favor is not dependent on human character, but it is an expression of His character. God's favor fell on Ruth and Boaz, but it also fell on bitter Naomi. In spite of the fact that Naomi has been bitter, in spite of the fact that she has blamed God for everything, even though she was experiencing the circumstances of her and her husband Elimelech's decisions, their choices, God's favor is coming Naomi's way. He, his favor, expresses his desire to redeem, to reconcile, and to restore. Let me read Psalm 103. Psalm 103, 1 to 14. My soul bless the Lord, and all that is in within me bless His holy name. My soul bless the Lord, and do not forget all His benefits. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He revealed his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. 
As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. You see, God's providential favor. And in the New Testament, that word favor is the word grace. God's grace is expressed not dependent upon your character, my character, our character. It's expressed to us. It's poured out upon us because of His character. That's the God whose wings become our shelter. Second thing, God's providential favor is well-timed. Do you see how His favor is well-timed in this story? His favor is always well-timed. His providence comes just at the right time, never too early, never too late, just in the moment that it is needed. It is opportune. Do you remember back in our study in Galatians, that word opportune, which comes from the Latin word orb portus, which reminds us that in the old days, the sailing ships would wait outside the harbor until the tide changed and the tide would move the ships into the harbor for safekeeping. God is moving. And whether we see him or not, he is at work. Naomi didn't see it, but she finally saw it. In that story, God is moving the tide of circumstances toward Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, and they're going to follow the tide into his harbor of grace. Will you? God is sovereign over the tide of human activities to bring to pass his will and his favor at just the right time. Third, God's providential favor rests on those who seek it. Going back to verses 10 to 12 in the story of Ruth, let me just read those right quickly. Verse 10, chapter 2, She fell face down, bowed to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor with you so that you notice me, although I'm a foreigner? Boaz answered her, Everything you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband's death has been fully reported to me. Verse 12, may the Lord reward you for what you have done and may you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. That is an Old Testament reference of seeking God's protection, God's favor, God's will. Ruth's noble character caught Boaz's attention. Favor rested on her because she placed herself under God's wings. Whatever the storm, the Lord is our refuge. Psalm 47. Psalm 47 or rather 46, Psalm 46, first three verses says, God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the seas, though its waters roar and foams and the mountains quake with its turmoil. God is our refuge. And those who seek his refuge, those who seek his favor, Find it. Fourth, God's providential favor satisfies our needs abundantly. When Boaz gave Ruth that lunch, she ate until she was satisfied. In other words, filled up and she had leftovers that she took back to Naomi. Psalm 63. Psalm 63 verses 1 to 8. Let me just read that quickly. Psalm 63, verse 1 through 8. God, you are my God. 
I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze you on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name, I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me as with rich food. Wow, you satisfy me as with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches because you are my helper. I rejoice in the shadow of your wings. There's that phrase again. I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. And then in John 10, verses 9 and 10, Jesus spoke these words. It says that the enemy came to steal and to kill, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. When God's providential favor comes our way, it's not just a smidgen, as my grandmother used to say. It's not just a little bit. It's abundant. It completely satisfies us. We have leftovers. God's providential favor satisfies us abundantly. Fifth, God's providential favor often is received from human hands. Where is God in all of this? It just might be that God is in the person who has come to your help. It just might be that God is in the hand that has given you food or extra money. It just might be that God is at work among people around you. It's important for us to be aware of how God is at work through people. God used Boaz to provide for and comfort and encourage Ruth. We saw that in verses 14 and 16. God used Boaz and his uh, harvesters to provide extra rations of grain for Ruth and Naomi. Through Boaz, God protected Ruth from harm while she gleaned in the fields. Through Boaz, God extended Ruth's opportunity to glean to the wheat harvest. It's very easy to see where God is in this. God is in the heart of Boaz. He's in the hands of Boaz. And that is often how God works in our lives. His favor comes through the hands and the hearts of others. Which leads me to number six. God's providential favor equips us to be his hands and heart of favor to others. What did Ruth do when she came home? She opened the baskets for Naomi to see all the grain she had gleaned. She gave Naomi the leftovers from her delicious lunch with Boaz. Ruth kept the leftovers from her lunch for Naomi. Ruth shared the barley with Naomi. God's favor in Ruth's life opened Naomi's eyes and answered the question for Naomi. Where is God in all of this? And Ruth continued to stay with Naomi and provided for her needs. God's providential favor, His grace, works in our lives so abundantly so that we can be His hands of favor and the lives of other people who are facing unfavorable circumstances. So what do I do now? What do we do? How do we respond to God in all of this? That's the question today for us. Not where is God in all this, but where am I in all of this? Well, let me just remind you that no matter how unfavorable, how uncomfortable, how hopeless your circumstances are right now, God has a plan. Seek His favor. Seek refuge under His 
wings. Trust him. But be patient. God's favor, God's providential favor and grace comes to us in his timing. Like the sailors waiting for the tide to move the ship into the harbor, we wait until God moves the tide of our circumstances and the tide of everything around us to move us to his favor, to his grace. So be patient, endure. And here's that word again, trust. But there's one more thing. Remember a couple of Sundays ago, we decided that we were going to be a Ruth for someone. This Sunday, let me encourage us all to be God's hand of grace and favor to someone. Don't just wait for God to satisfy your needs. Be courageous. Be like Boaz. Go the extra mile. Be God's heart. Be God's hands of favor and grace to those around you who have a need. That's how we respond. And now let me say one more thing. And that is, if you do not have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus, though your material, your physical, your monetary needs might be met because God showers His grace on all people. But spiritually speaking, the page of your story will never turn to grace, eternal grace, until you repent of your sin and trust in Jesus as your Redeemer. And so I want to say to all of you today who are not yet walking as followers of Jesus to allow the Holy Spirit to turn that page in your heart. Repent of your sin. Trust in Jesus. Surrender everything, everything you are, everything you have. Surrender it all to Jesus and follow him as a disciple. And you will experience God's providential favor, His grace, His abundance, His eternal life, and your life will be forevermore changed. Father, we thank you for this beautiful story that has reminded us that in the middle of all this, here you are, working out your plan, moving your will and your way, your goodness and your will intersecting our lives. Thank you, God. And we pray that today you have encouraged us and inspired us to be faithful, to be patient, to seek your grace, your protection, your favor, to seek refuge under your wings, and to wait patiently while you provide the fields of wheat for us to glean. And we pray for our family and friends who have never trusted in Jesus as their Savior. And we're praying today that your Holy Spirit will convict them of their need for salvation and they will surrender their lives to Jesus. And we pray all of this in the name of Christ, who is our Redeemer. Amen. Well, God bless you. Please let us know how these Bible studies are encouraging you and helping you grow spiritually. You can contact us at info at ibcmanila.org. We would love to hear how God is inspiring you and changing your lives, changing your heart and your perspective, especially in these days. So please let us know. And again, if you have needs, we want to hear. So please let us know if there's a way that we can be God's providential favor in your life. God bless you. I love you. Have a great day.